God is longing for individuals to be repentant in nature. Amen. God is longing for individuals who have a desire not to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And here's the thing that I want to put in your life for your consideration again. I want to tell us that despite the comfort and the reassurance that sin brings us sometimes, you have to trust and lean into God that there is an alternative for you to lean into when you decide to let go of what's been comfortable for so long. Because it's the comfort of the sin that makes us less likely to turn away from it. Because what am I going to find comfort in? What am I going to lean on? God said, don't worry about it. I got, look, I'm all wise. I'm all knowing. I got it under control. There's something, somebody that I already have in the wings for you, but I can't release them until you give me that. Glory. <laughs> I, I, I can't send you so-and-so. I can't send you your, your, your husband. I can't send you your wife. I can't send you the promotion. I can't send you a new level of joy. I can't send you a new level of patience, a new level of humility until you let go of some things. Amen. Ooh, this is good. Shonda, you ready for this? As long as I'm this direction, I can't get what's in this direction. (laughs) I can't get what's on this side until I turn away from what's on this side. So whatever's distracting me on this side, it's a whole bunch of... Oh, this is good. I just saw this. Somebody in here right now, there are a whole bunch of things, promises for you, literally behind your spiritual back, but you can't access them until you turn away from some things and say, I repent. Yeah, that was comfortable. That was reassuring, but I want to access some things that God has for me. But you must turn away. Well, if you don't know, I'm Pastor Khalid, and I'm the pastor of this amazing ministry, Redemption Church, and I welcome you today. Man, we are in a series, Life Be Life In, and this series allows us to lean into this thought that life gets hard sometimes. Life gets challenging. If we're honest, life is frustrating. Sometimes life can be overwhelming. In fact, we have an operating definition to help us cope with our learning, and it reads as follows. Life be life and can be defined as such. It is the moments in our lives that are difficult and overwhelming, and here's the catch. There isn't much we can do about it. And sometimes we can call, and the answer is there. And we move on. Sometimes we can pay into a situation and the answer is what we need in the the check that we cut. And then there are those moments in life where there is no natural resource available and we just got to sit in the devastation of being overwhelmed because there's not much we can do about it. We've been going through this series and we've been looking at uh, through four different lanes or lenses uh, why life be life. And first, the L is the Lord, the Lord, the master of our lives. He allows things to happen for a greater purpose, a purpose that transcends our understanding. Then there's the I. The I means that we will go through things because we live in an imperfect world. The Bible makes it very clear that this world is not our home. It's full of heartache, pain, disappointment, struggles, troubles. The Bible promises us that when we are born, our days are full of troubles. Then the F means that we are flawed people. As much as I try to get it right, nay, nay, sometimes I'm going to make mistakes. Even with the best intentions, I'm going to make some wrong decisions. And then last but not least, that E means the enemy. So between the Lord living in an imperfect world, us being flawed, and the enemy, life will be life in sometimes. And that's the purpose of this series, for help us understand and navigate with a proper perspective on how to handle life when it comes swinging. The last two weeks, Minister Gemma and Minister Jared did a phenomenal job. If you want to show them some love. Uh, Gemma spoke from the subject, Keep It Together, part two, and, and the, I would say the big idea from that when I was listening was very clear. Sometimes we don't get to catch our breaths when life is life. <laughs> and there are other times where the reward for our obedience is another struggle. Then Minister Jared last week talked about counterproductive counsel. That is counsel that sounds good on the surface, Tony, but it really, instead of helping us, it's hurting us. 
So that means people with the best of intentions sometimes give us advice that we don't need to hear. All spiritual advice ain't wise advice. Mm. (laughs) Because if your timing is off, that means you're not using wisdom on what to apply and when to apply it. So I'll let you go back and listen to those sermons, but I want to make sure we are streamlining our learning. As a professor, one of the things that I tell my students, learning should be a fluid process. There should be a clear beginning, middle, and an end to our learning together. Today, we're going to look at Job 38, 1 and 3, 1 through 3, and then Job 42, 1 through 6. Now, this is my warning message. With grace, with love, and compassion, Nate, this is not our typical Easter message. I'm not going to tell you a story that we have mastered or we are familiar with, and I'm not saying that story is not important. I don't want to feed into or perpetuate our partial understanding of God and what he desires. The Easter story, the resurrection story, it is a pillar to our faith, Corbin. There's no debate to that ideology. The concern, though, is if we only view God through his love and his mercy and his grace, we fail to realize God in his totality. And I think that's the issue that permeates the Western church today is we have fallen in love with specific attributes of God and made that our God itself. So if God is a provider, and I know he is a provider, if I only view him as a provider, when I need a healer, I don't believe he can do it because I only view him to be a provider. (laughs) When I need comfort and I need wisdom, if I only view him as a healer or provider, I don't think he can give me the resource I need mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually to navigate whatever I'm facing because I only worship him, praise him, believe him to be a healer and a provider. I argue this this morning, that verses Job 38 through Job 42 is a more complete picture of who God is based off his responses. Based off of who God is, according to the questions that he asked Job, I'm going to put this in our lap too. The reason why I'm challenging our partial understanding, partial understanding produces an incomplete or an underappreciation for God. Not that we don't appreciate God, we underappreciate him because we're looking at him through a vacuum. But these scriptures highlight aspects of God beyond his love, his mercy, and his grace. If you haven't caught on yet, I'm not appealing to your emotions. I'm appealing to your supernatural perspective. I'm speaking to your spiritual insight, your spiritual mind, because it is through understanding God through a spiritual lens not our feelings, that we can be better. Let's read what the word of God has to say. This is after silence from God for dozens of chapters. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you. And you must answer them. We step down to Job 42. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I love verse 5 and 6. I had only heard about you before. But now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything. Say everything. Everything. I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Today, we are speaking from the subject, when God answers. When God answers. We're going to sit on this slide for a second because I want to prepare our thinking as we lean into our learning. We know that Job, in his uh, uh, frustration, in his pain, and his feelings of hopelessness, we see traces of a desire to want an answer. How many of us have been in that space in life where I can keep fighting if I know why I'm going through what I'm going through? (laughs) If I know what the purpose is, if I know what the end, if I know what the end date is, God, I will endure to the end. But 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 it's one thing to feel like I can make it and believe that God will answer me. But what do we do when he says, I'm gonna let you sit in it for a while? I'm going to let you vent. I'm going to let you get some things off your chest. I hear everything you're saying. I hear the debate. I hear the discourse. I hear the back and forth that you all are engaging in. And little do you all know that you're missing the mark in who I am and what I desire. 
God finally answers. And here's the thing that's interesting that I want to put in our lap. When he answers, he doesn't answer Job's question. Job wants to know why. What did I do to deserve this? Why? And I'm generalizing. And God does not give him the answer. We have to be okay with going through things and never know why. In our egotistical, self-centered, self-absorbed way of thinking in Western culture, we want to know everything. And God says, you have to be okay not knowing why I did what I did. In fact, if I supply every need, that means that if you don't get the answer, you don't need the answer. Whoo, that's good. You may want the answer, but you don't need the answer for your development. You don't need the answer to keep on chugging along. You don't need, because here's the thing. If we knew the answer, it would break our backs. If we knew the answer to some of the things that we would go through, it would cripple or shatter potentially our faith. So sometimes being naive or ignorant is a favor from God. I love you enough not to give you all the answers because if you knew everything that I was up to, if you knew all the discussions that that were happening about you, if you knew that the enemy really tried to get you time and time again, it would discourage you. So I'm going to shield you from the answer. You don't even know what to ask for, but I'm going to give you what you need. And here's the thinking that I want to give us this morning, Tony. When God answers, watch this, we must be mature enough to absorb and appreciate whatever he says. Because what we do, when we don't like the answer, we go pray again. Well, let me extend the fast. I don't think, I think that was my flesh. I, I, I think, no, that couldn't, that's not the God I serve. When God answers... We must be willing participants to absorb. And that word absorb there is very interesting. That means it's seeping into the crevices of my DNA and my perspective. I don't just accept it and take it. I allow it to resonate with who I am. I allow it to spill into my belief system, my perspective. It's becoming a part of me in the way that I move. Meaning, God, when you give it to me, I'll let it soak in. When God answers... I can't promise you that he's going to give you the answer you want, but I can guarantee you he'll give you the answer you need. Here's the interesting thing about this text, and then we're going to get the ball rolling here. Out the gate, God comes out swinging. And his response, the impetus for his response is to set the stage for this thought, I am God and you're man. Instantly, he tips the power dynamic, we are not equals. Your questions, your desires, your longingness to communicate to me, your desire to summon me, you're acting like we're, we are not equals. So I'm going to tip the scale of this power dynamic and reveal to you that I am God and you are man. Right, right. Ladies and gentlemen, we must get that in the crevices of our mind that God is God and we are man. What does that mean? I am weak. He is strong. He's all knowing. I know just a little bit. I think I know what I'm doing, but he knows everything. He's wise, all infinite in his wisdom. I know a little something, something. I've made some bad decisions. Every decision he makes is a good one. Why? Because he's God and I am man. And whatever I am facing, how big, how small, it's still teeny tiny compared to how great and God is, uh, God is whenever we're facing what we're facing. So I'm going to give you several attributes, characteristics that paint the picture, a complete picture of who God is in his totality. Let's look at the first one here. Um, This scripture, before we get into that, got ahead of myself. I'm excited. (laughs) In Job's venting session, he leans on this metaphor of being in a courtroom with God. And it is in God's response that we see here what Job says, that Job has to take the witness stand. (laughs) Listen to what Job says here. He says, my complaint today is still a bitter one, and I tried hard not to groan aloud. If only I knew where to find God, I would go to his court. I would lay out my case and present my arguments. Then I would listen to his reply and understand what he says to me. Would he use his great power to argue with me? No. He would give me a fair hearing. Honest people can reason with him, so I would be forever acquitted by my judge. He has a false sense of understanding of what God's accountability looked like as a judge. So setting the stage and what we've read, okay, you want to go into a courtroom with me? Let's go into my courtroom. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to put this in our laps. Be careful what you wish for. 
when you're, even from a place of frustration, even from a place of venting, watch what you say because God hears every word. And in his sovereign nature and his all-knowing nature, there are things he will let slide. You get a pass today, baby. And then there are some other things. No, 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 no. We don't talk like that to me. I got to put you on the witness stand and you got to answer some questions for me. And in his asking questions, see, it's one thing. Go ahead, Thomas. It's one thing when we have questions for God, but it's another when God has questions for us. And God is not asking questions to receive information. He's asking questions to reveal information. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. Put that, put that in your paper, in your notes, whatever. If you've got a phone, uh, God does not ask questions to receive information. He asks questions to reveal. In other words, in my questioning, you're going to understand some things about yourself and about me or both that you didn't realize before. That's right. Whew. So we see God asks a series of questions that reveal his character, his nature, his might, his power. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have. Now, if you ever wondered where Jesus get his thug tendencies, <laughs> brace yourself like a man. <laughs> see, if we have this picture that God is just this soft pushover, there's this thing, Tony McKee, called accountability. Oh, I've heard every word you said, and you asked me some questions. It's my turn. Brace yourself. I have some questions for you, and you don't have an option. You must answer them. Man, here are the first two attributes that I want to give us as we understand God in his entirety. God is sovereign, and God is self-sufficient. Let me put some things in our lap. Let me define sovereignty for you. We talk about it. We sing about it. To be sovereign, when God says, I am sovereign, that word literally translates to mean supreme authority. Not just authority. We all have authority to some degree, whether on our jobs, whether with our kids, family dynamics, uh, within the church space. We all have authority to some degree. But God says, y'all got this cute little authority. I am the supreme authority. Supreme authority lawyer, meaning that everything, anything, the things that don't happen, things that do happen, they must come through me. Everything you face in your life, I signed off on it. The things that didn't sign off on your life, that didn't happen in your life, I signed off on that too. Every friend you wanted, every friend that wanted to be with you, every relationship, all of that stuff, I allowed. It happened with my knowledge because I'm the supreme authority. I'm the supreme authority. I don't answer to anyone. Your, your ignorant words suggest you don't know that I am the ultimate authoritative figure. Right. You're talking about things. I know everything, and I can assess by your questions that you don't know anything. In fact, it's God's sovereignty that we should thank him for because there are some things that we don't know about in our frustration that he wants to say it could have been worse. <laughs> It, my sovereignty, my supreme authority, I allowed you to take a couple on the chin, but really there's some things that the enemy wants to bring to you to knock you out, to take you out, to kill you, to destroy you. Baby, this ain't nothing. That's a Band-Aid. There's some things that you could have endured that are open wounds that could have destroyed you. My sovereign nature protected you even though you're going through right now. But your ignorant words don't allow you to see that I still have a plan and purpose that's rooted in my supreme authority. And then God is self-sufficient. <laughs> How do we know God is self-sufficient? Can I teach you today? In Job, we see them re reference God, generally speaking, as God. God, when we translate that to the Hebrew, it, it generally means just a deity, a higher being. But here in this passage, then the Lord, it doesn't say then God answered Job. That's critically important. Nate, it says then the Lord answered Job. Why is that important? Because when God is summoned by Job, he says the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Okay, pastor, do you, you, you're arriving at a point here? Yes, I am. The Lord here in this scripture is Yahweh. If you don't know what Yahweh means, Yahweh means I am that I am. <laughs> I am that I am means I'm whatever you need me to be when you need me to be it how I want to be it. Uh, I can do anything that's possible and I don't need your help. Need, need I remind you about uh, Moses' interaction with God when he says, yo, what do I say to the people when they ask about you and why I'm here? He said, just tell them I am sent you. And when the children of Israel hear that, they know, okay, the God of anything 
is with us. The God who's a provider. I'm not just a provider when I show up. I just got to be I am. When I show up, sometimes, Tony, I'm a provider. I'm a way maker. I'm a helper. I'm a comforter. I'm a guide. I'm a healer. I'm your wisdom. I'm your teacher. I'm whatever. I am whatever you need. I'm filling a blank. Just filling a blank. But, but here, here's the thing. When Job is running his mouth, he doesn't say the provider is coming. He doesn't just say the teacher is coming. He doesn't just say the all-powerful is coming. He says, I am is in the courtroom. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but I don't want to call anybody to the carpet who has endless resources and capacities. He says, you want to talk to me? I am is here. All that I am and will be was is in this room with you right now. And all that I am will be and was, I don't need your help. That's what makes me self-sufficient. Everything I need to be for you, I am through me and because of me only. I don't need your permission. I don't need your prayers. I don't need your fasting. I don't need your tithes. I don't need your offering. I am because I am, and I don't need you to be I am because I am. I was before you were. I will be after you. I am that I am because I choose to be. And I don't need your help. Oh, this, this is the side of God that we forget about. This is the side of God where if he really wanted to show up and say, I don't owe you a conversation. I don't owe you anything because I am. I'm God. He says, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you. I am has some questions for you. Let's look at these questions. He said, well, before, we get in, before we get into that, these next couple slides highlight the creative, and the, the creative nature and the powerful nature of God. So we have God as sovereign, we have God as self-sufficient, we have him as creative, and we have him powerful. Now, the thing that I want to put in our laps for those of us who are taking notes, God's level of creativity is an extension of his power, and his power is self-sustaining. Many of the systems that he has in place work without him in intervening at this point. Look at this scripture right here. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? That's enough for us to go home. Just shut it down. That question right there for me would have been like, just, you would just stop, stop, God. It's cool. You're right. I have no idea. Where, and that's like, if you're asking, this remind me of like when I was a kid growing up. And my mom and dad would hit us with something that just kind of shut it down. What light bill you paying? <laughs> what food you put in the refrigerator? You better get some lunch meat and be quiet. <laughs> just, just shut it down. On a high level, God said, I got some questions for you. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundation and who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it with thick darkness? For I locked, I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. We see God and his creation talking to nature, saying, you have limits and you got to listen. He said, where were you? Can I, can I read some more thoughts to you that I found them, y'all. If you were here first service, I loaf big time, but I got you now. I got you now. He said, and, and, and Job, this is not on the screen, but listen to some other questions that God asked Job. This is uh, Job 38, 19, and I'll just keep reading. He said, where does light come from and where does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there? But of course you know all this, for you were born, petty God, for you were born before it was all created and you were so very experienced. Have you visited the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of, the, of hell? I have reserved them as west weapons for the times of trouble, for the day of battle and war. Where is the path to the source of light? 
Where is the home of the east wind? Who created a channel for the torrents of rain? Who laid out the path for lightning? Who makes the rain fall on barren land in the desert where no one lives? Who sends rain to satisfy the parched ground and make the tender grass spring up? Does the rain have a father? Who gives birth to the dew? Who is the mother of the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? For, uh, for the water turns to ice as hard as rock and the surface of the water freezes. Can you answer any of my questions, Job? Where does darkness go? A fundamental yet simultaneously profound question. Where does darkness, can anybody answer that question in the room? Where, where, where does, where, what is the path of light? Have you trained the clouds to cry out when there's a deserted area that needs some rain? Where do you store up the snow? <laughs> Where do you store up the hell? Where, 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 where does this go? You clearly must know because you're so experienced, Joe. My creative power, and here's the thing, it's self-sustaining. Ooh, this is good. This kiss came to me. I don't have to check on the clouds. The clouds come talk to me when they need to come out. <laughs> I've trained the clouds to say it's time for rain. <laughs> I, I unlocked the storehouse for snow. Not you, sir. I've trained the deserted areas where nobody lives to cry out and say, it's getting a little dry around here. I got a system that's self-sustaining and I don't need your help. And you're worried about a few sores on your body. Not that the sores are not painful, not that what you're not going through is real. I want to make it abundantly clear, but what we're going through seems significantly smaller when we look at God through this lens. This man said, not this man, my fault. God said, who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? And as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness. Y'all, that's the God we serve. And he ain't breaking a sweat. He not breaking a sweat. He's creative power and he's created a system where it runs itself in other words i'm in control i will always be in control because everything that happens respects my sovereignty nature must get permission from me nature <laughs> do y'all hear what i'm saying nature as ruthless, as unpredictable, as reckless as it may feel, they require permission from God. And we trip in and minimizing God because of our circumstance. He said, man, I, I did this. I got this system and, and you, you're tripping about what you're tripping about. That's small potatoes to the things that I got managing beyond you. So we got God as creative. Then... We have God as wise. For those of us who need an operating definition, wisdom is the ability and the power to make the best decision according to what is seen. So we say a person is wise when we see them navigate what's in front of them. Man, that was a wise decision. I wouldn't have done the same thing in that situation based off what was seen. Here's the interesting thing, though. Uh, um, God's sight, what he sees, is not limited to our present reality. What makes him the most qualified to be all wise is he simultaneously, and I don't know how he does it. It, is, it, it does not appeal to our natural reality, our logical perspective. He simultaneously sees the past, he sees the present, and he sees tomorrow. So he makes, the, 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 makes decisions according to all three of those because they're in his line of sight. This is where the perspective is so profound because we make decisions based off what we see only in front of us, but God makes decisions based off of what he sees for things that we don't even know is coming yet. He's making decisions about today based off something he knows is going to happen 90 days from now. Man. Look, I want to make this, I want to bring this down to a very basic level. How many of us, by a show of hands, have, have thought something was for us and you were initially disappointed, and then things played out, and then you said to yourself, I see it now. I see it now. 
That was God exercising his wisdom through his supreme authority to say, you don't need that. And if I gave it to you, I'm wise enough to know it would destroy you. If I gave it to you, you wouldn't appreciate it. If I gave it to you, it would be a distraction for our relationship. If I gave it to you, it would be harmful to your progress. I'm wise enough to know based off what I see in your yesterday, today, and tomorrow that you don't need that. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. It is in God's nose that we better appreciate who we are in him. The yeses can pacify us in our spiritual development. Our yeses can cripple us. It can demotivate us to want for more. But in the no's, I'm asking tough questions to myself. Okay, God, what are you trying to show me in this season? It is in the no's that I'm saying, God, what do you need to fix about me in this season? God, what are you up to in this season? I don't know what you're up to, but you're up to something, and I trust you. Here's what I want to give us, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever God is doing in his wisdom, you must have the audacity to trust him regardless. Because he's more wise than you and me. My wisdom is limited, but his wisdom is limitless. He knows everything all the time. Let's look at scripture to support this idea. Would you discredit my justice? Man, he's still firing questions at him. Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud and bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them in all the dust together, all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. Here is what God is asking me. He said, are you wise enough? Do you have the capacity? Do you have the ability to pick the people who deserve punishment? Can you see through your limited lens people who are suffering from pride? And then when you see them, can you give them this punishment? Because it ain't just about what you see, but can you punish them accordingly? It's the decisions that we make according to what we see. So can you see them and then do something about it and not just do something about it? Here are the parameters. Can you uh, take the proud and, and humble them by crushing the wicked where they stand? That's what you need to do. If you can do these things, we can talk. If you can do what I'm asking, can, can you unleash your wrath to those who deserve it? If you can do that, I'll give you an answer. But until then, what are we talking about? Next slide. Then God is love. This is where we must lean in and understand. So we got God is self-sufficient. God is sovereign. He's creative. He's powerful. He's wise. And we have God in his loving nature. It is in Job 42 that we see how loving God is. These verses demonstrate the loving nature of God despite the flaws we see in Job and his friends. Ladies and gentlemen, it is through Job and his friends that we see that God is itching and yearning to project his love on us despite the mistakes that we make. Despite the mistakes that we make, God is still yearning and looking for opportunities to project his love on us. Let's look in scripture to support this idea. I had only, this is Job, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back, and this is after a series of questions. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Here's the first thing you need to know about God. God responds to repentance. I want to define this. Because one of the more egregious mistakes that we make in our culture is that we use God forgive me synonymously with I repent. To ask for forgiveness is not the same fundamentally as asking for, uh, uh, suggesting that you're repenting. To say forgive me, it's asking for excusal for something that I just did, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm willing to change my behavior. So to repent means that I'm not just asking for forgiveness. God, I'm, asking, I'm telling you, I'm committing to turning away. That's what repent means, to turn away from. So what do we see here in verse 6? He says, I take back everything I said, remorse, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. This right here, uh, from a historical context, this is the ultimate demonstration of humility. And this is Job's way of saying, I'm sorry, and I won't do it again. I'm sorry. 
and I won't do it again. We cannot uh, limit this interaction to just trials and tribulation. There are things in our lives, if we are honest with ourselves, that we have not given up to God. And I'm talking about the things that we can see and the things that we can't see. See, we are less likely, Corbin, to own things that people can't see. Pride, I can't really see that unless you're in a crisis. Jealousy, I can't really see that until somebody around you is getting what you feel you deserve. Fits of rage, I really can't see that until somebody make you mad on the wrong day at the wrong time. We can't limit sins to be those external things that we see outwardly, i.e. Uh, pornography, uh, vices like drugs and alcohol, fornication, uh, lust, those types of lying, uh, stealing. Those things need to be, we need to turn away from those things. But then there are other things. Can we sit in the dust and the ashes and say, I'm sorry. I'm turning away from this. God is longing for individuals to be repentant in nature. Amen. God is longing for individuals who have a desire not to keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And here's the thing that I want to put in your life for your consideration again. I want to tell us that despite the comfort and the reassurance that sin brings us sometimes, you have to trust and lean into God that there is an alternative for you to lean into when you decide to let go of what's been comfortable for so long. Because it's the comfort of the sin that makes us less likely to turn away from it. Because what am I going to find comfort in? What am I going to lean on? God said, don't worry about it. I got, look, I'm all wise. I'm all knowing. I got it under control. There's something, somebody that I already have in the wings for you, but I can't release them until you give me that. Glory. I, I, I can't send you so-and-so. I can't send you your, your, your husband. I can't send you your wife. I can't send you the promotion. I can't send you a new level of joy. I can't send you a new level of patience, a new level of humility until you let go of some things. Amen. Ooh, this is good. Shonda, you ready for this? As long as I'm this direction, I can't get what's in this direction. <laughs> I can't get what's on this side until I turn away from what's on this side. So whatever's distracting me on this side, it's a whole bunch of, pro oh, this is good. I just saw this. Somebody in here right now, there are a whole bunch of things, promises for you, literally behind your spiritual back, but you can't access them until you turn away from some things and say, I repent. Yeah, that was comfortable. That was reassuring, but I want to access some things that God has for me. But you must turn away. You must turn away. Well, I've always been this way. So what? So what? Turn anyways. Somebody need to write that down. I got to turn anyways. 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 Unanswered questions. Turn anyways. Lack of confidence. Turn anyways. If I serve a God who can lock up the ocean and get the clouds get permission from him, surely he has a plan for me when I turn away from whatever's holding me back from what he has for me. <laughs> If God can make an alligator, a hippopotamus, as scripture says, scripture indicates in this, and I'm, I'm not making this up, scripture indicates as he's talking to Job, he says, look, the alligator is my pet. It's my pet. You're afraid of it. I play with this. We play fetch. That ain't in the scripture, y'all. I just made that up. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I don't want y'all looking for that. Where are we playing fetch at? This, 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 this is my little play thing. So, so if he can play with alligators and lock the clouds up in the seas and all of that, surely there is a plan for you when you have the courage to say, I have a repentant heart. Yeah. Yeah. All right. this, this is, and here's the thing, man. Job found it in himself to say, I'm sorry. And sin wasn't the prerequisite for why, what he was in anyways. Next slide. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz and the, Tem the Temanite, I am, I got it right this time. <laughs> I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. So take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer on your behalf. I will not treat you as you deserve for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. We see God next as a redeemer. God 
redeems. Now, for those of us who need a definition for, for redeem, uh, y'all know me, I'm, I'm going to give you what you need. To redeem means to save from the consequence or the penalty of sin. I'm going to buy back. Your debt, it's canceled out. You don't owe me anything. I've redeemed you. This act is always a representation of God's forgiving nature. Now, there's some interesting parallels here that I want to bring to your attention as I was studying. Um, it's very insightful in nature. And God, in the Old Testament, he sprinkles breadcrumbs crumb, about a coming Savior named Jesus. And we see a glimpse of what is going to happen for mankind. Job and Jesus, I want to make this clear, I am not deifying Job. Job is not a Savior. Job is not a mediator. Jesus is the only savior. Jesus is the king of kings. Jesus is the only mediator that matters. That's right. But there are some interesting parallels between Job and Jesus that shed insight on how God functions and desire to save you and me through Jesus. Yes. Job and Jesus, listen to this. Job suffers in more ways than one like Jesus and not because of sin. Job and Jesus both suffer, but it's not as a penalty because of sin. Second, Job is mocked and questioned by those around him despite his innocence. Job and Jesus didn't do anything wrong, yet they're mocked, they're questioned, they're both betrayed to a degree, even though they didn't do anything wrong. They were innocent. Job is used for the friends as a tool to redeem and relieve them of their offenses with God. Look at what he says. The Lord said, look, I'm not happy with y'all. So you're going to take these burnt offerings and then Job, he's going to pray for you. And it is through his prayer that I will relinquish you of the penalty you deserve. I'm going to redeem you through Job, the few of you, not mankind. I want to make that clear. But Job foreshadows what Jesus will do or did for all of us. Right. Jesus redeemed us. God, rather than punishing us altogether, us enduring the penalty of sin time and time again, he says, I'm going to send my son, Jesus Christ, to stand in your behalf. Job prayed on their behalf. Jesus endured on our behalf what we deserve. He says, I'm going to use Job as a foreshadowing on a small level of what's to come. The redeeming power of God still exists. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're your Lord and Savior today, he desires to redeem you. And here's the thing that I want to make very clear to you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, seriously, all the baggage, all the sin, all the things that you've done are piling up behind you. And there's no Savior to cancel out the debt. And here's the thing that, that really baffles me, Pastor Reggie, is that you have this opportunity. The spiritual contract is simple. You confess, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. The blood of Jesus Christ saved you. Boom. It's done. You're dead. Oh, I don't care what you've done, how you've done it. I don't care how, how egregious your sins are. You believe in Jesus Christ, the debt is canceled. That's the deal. That's the package. Now, after you believe and accept Jesus Christ in your heart, then we get into sanctification, holiness, righteousness, and all that stuff. But I want us to understand, I don't want to stand before a God who is a judge with baggage behind me that could have been relieved of me. I don't, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. Just like God used Job to spare these men, God wants to understand there's a man named Jesus who wants to spare us. I don't care what you've done. <laughs> this slide, next one. When I was reading this, um, we got to look at this beneath the surface, y'all. Because we've taught this through a superficial, materialistic lens only. When I say we, I'm talking preachers in general. But there's so much more here that I want to shed light on. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Then all his brothers, sisters, and former friends came and feasted with him in his home. Now, let me pause there because as I was reading this last, last service, something came to me in real time before we give our next attribute. You may be asking, where were they before? I know you were thinking that. Here's what I want to tell you. There are people in your life who may want to intervene, but they don't have the divine permission to intervene because you may become, they may become a distraction. 
It's not that they don't want to be there. It's God doesn't allow them to be there. Because as long as you're by yourself, as long as you don't have people encouraging you, comforting you ahead of schedule, then, then they will always be a distraction. But you can give your attention to God. So there are seasons of isolation that are inevitable and prescribed to your destiny, prescribed to your purpose. There are some people who want to intervene and they're not allowed to. That's good. When they text, the message ain't delivered. <laughs> when they call, the call is dropped. Could be because they have a droid and not an iPhone, but that's the other part of it too. <laughs> Had to sneak it in there, sneak it in there. <laughs> Had to sneak it in there. <laughs> All the people in the iPhone ministry say hallelujah, please. Hallelujah. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, but, but God will orchestrate people to stay away yes. until it's time. Yes. And they, they, they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. Here's the last attribute. God is a restorer. Yes. God restores. Now, I want to give us a definition of what it means to restore, uh, to bring back, to reinstate, to return, or to repair. To repair. To return, to reinstate, to bring back, or to repair. I want us to look at this beyond the natural things being brought back restored, returned. God desires for us to experience restoration in deeper ways. I know when this is taught, we say double for your trouble through a natural superficial lens. And I do believe God can use material things to make a point about him that is much deeper than the thing itself. But then there are other things that we should be longing for that are more important than things. And here's the interesting part, Tony. He didn't just repair, restore, return. He gave him a double portion of what he had before he entered the crisis. Okay. Now, what does this mean for us? This means that before my crisis, I had joy, but now I'm in this season of despair. God is gracious enough not just to give you the joy that you had. He's going to give you a double portion of the joy you had before you went into the crisis. Ooh, wee that's enough right there to make you run, to know that when I make it out, it could be in God's plan for my life to receive more of what I had before I went into it. Yeah. You had confidence before. Now you're feeling insecure. But God is saying, I'm going to give you a double dose of confidence. Yes, you're going to have a little more lean in your walk now, not because of you, but because of what I did through you. Right. You're, you're, you're going to have a greater sense of hope now. You were hopeful and then you were hopeless in the situation, but your hope in me and through me is going to be magnified now that you survived. <laughs> You had peace before, and then chaos ensued, and you became confused. But I'm going to give you a greater peace because you survived. Stop asking God for things only. Ask him for those attributes that really matter as we navigate life. I want double peace. I want double joy. I want double hope. I want double inspiration. I want double encouragement. I want double, double, double of those things that represent the God in me. Beautiful. So, ooh, this is good. (laughs) Brother Mark, watch this. If you're turning away, you better ask for double in your turning. (laughs) God, God, I'm I'm, going to humbly ask that as I give this situation to you, I'm expecting double patience. I'm expecting double discipline. I'm expecting, expecting double uh, 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 comfort. I'm expecting double you being a God. I'm expecting double God. Because God, so he doesn't just give you back to where you were originally. He says, I'm going to raise you up to experience more. Man. Man. God wants, see, this is the cool thing about God. The first 41 chapters, who would have thought it ended like this? Who would have thought God wants to restore. Huh. He wants to restore relationships. He wants to restore self-esteem. He wants to restore the things that actually make us go. Because here's the thing. If we're re- waiting for restoration for things, but we're still depressed, what good is that thing? I'm sad with a bigger car. I'm sad with more money. I'm sad with a promotion. I'm sad with a bigger house. In fact, the more I get, the more disqualified I become to experience those things, and I can't appreciate what God has blessed me with because my mind and my heart ain't changed. That's good. 
That's good. <laughs> oh, that's the secret right there to why God ain't said no, because you can't handle it mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, right. because you're still in the same state wanting new things, but until you get rid of that old mindset, you can't experience the new things that he has for you. So God wants to restore your mind. He wants to restore your heart. He wants to restore your emotions so you can appreciate the things and opportunities he has for you. Lawyer, mm. I need you to join me up here, sir. Come on up here, sir. This, this, this right here, I'm not minimizing things. I'm not minimizing nice things. But they cannot be the parameters by which we define God. Right. If I had to pick between attributes of God, more of that, and the thing, give me the attributes of God. Amen. Because if I get more wisdom, that will help me manage the things that he has for me. <laughs> so some of it, and I don't mean this in a condescending way, you get more new, thing, more new things with no wisdom, you're going to be stuck. Here's a big idea. Sometimes we won't get the answer we want, but we must trust he knows what he is doing. We must trust he knows what he is doing. I'm to a season and a place in my life as I face my own challenges, I face my own unique obstacles personally, professionally, in the ministry, as a man, being a better husband, father, whatever you want to call it, I have to be okay with unanswered questions. And when I say unanswered, I'm talking about the question answered that I really, really want. And I have to put my mind on these thoughts that God is mighty, he's all-knowing, he's all-wise, he's all-powerful, he's sovereign. Yeah. And so I hang my hat on those things yeah rather than what I desire to understand. This morning, there is an individual I know that has similar perspectives and experiences. And she's been very, very diligent and longing for more, longing for connection, longing for a sense of restoration. And today, I'm here to say, we will be as your church family. You don't know who you are yet, but I'm about to call you up. Your church family wants to be a part of your restoration. And when I say restoration, I'm not talking about a thing. I'm talking about restored hope. Restored peace. Restored patience. Restored humility. Greater double portion of humility. Double portion of joy. Double portion of peace despite what you face. Princess, come up here, please. Come up here, please. Come up here, please. <clears throat> you have no idea what's about to hit you, man. You have no idea what's about to hit you. But here's what I want you to know. God has you on his mind constantly. Constantly. He has not forgotten about you. We have not forgotten about you. He sees you. He loves you. He wants more from you. You keep chasing him. You keep pursuing him. But it is through this act of kindness and love that you're going to see in a minute where you can experience a greater sense of hope. Greater sense of peace. A greater sense of restoration. So here's what we're going to do. Y'all look. Grab your things. We're going to dismiss from the parking lot. If you got tithes and offering, bring it next week. We ain't here for that. We gonna dismiss from the parking lot. Let's do the benediction and we gonna celebrate. Just go by my, the pastor spot, the pastor parking, just go out there. And we gonna walk out in a few minutes. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for a productive worship experience today. We thank you for the gentle reminder that you are a redeemer. You desire for us to repent. You are a restorer, God. It is through your son, Jesus Christ, that we can experience all that you have for us, both tangibly and intangibly, through things and through those attributes that reflect who you are, those things that we cannot see, like patience, hope, joy, peace, those things, God, what really drives us into purpose. God, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity to rally around your daughter, our sister in Christ. 
for her to be reminded today in this moment that you see her, you value her, you love her, that you have not forgotten about her. There is more, there is a great plan, there is a future for her life, God. God, we, we, we thank you. We believe this demonstration of your provision will be a testament to how great you are to her. And people watching will inquire and she has no choice but to say, child, I have no idea, but God looks out for me time and time and time and time again and time again and time again. And let me tell you about a man named Jesus. Mm. So God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now y'all head to the parking lot. We'll be out there in a second. Y'all, y'all grab your things. We're going to experience what God has for you. Mmm.